Welcome to Supply Circles, stories from the innovators, disruptors, and improvers in supply chain management today, brought to you by AI Group. Hello, I'm James Scotland, and this is Supply Circles. In this podcast, I interview supply chain professionals and influencers, and we discuss the latest ideas and solutions to supply chain improvement in Australia today. I ask them for insights into the emerging tactical and strategic solutions to the current three big business challenges of digitalization, decarbonization, and ongoing disruptions. And today we're going to talk about all three of the big Ds. My guest is Dr. Kate Brooks, and we're going to talk about her passion project, guiding Australian businesses on how they can start decarbonizing their business. And this involves, of course, not just decarbonization, but also disruption and digitalization. It's going to be a good chat. This is a critical issue for all businesses and all supply chain managers. It is coming fast to a business near you. So let's find out what it's all about. Great to have you on the show, Kate. How are you? Thanks, James. I'm well. Um, you're coming from uh, Perth and uh, I'm in Brisbane. Um, so so we're, we're covering, we're spanning the continent today. Which is uh, which is always nice. I hope it's not too cold there. It's a little bit rainy, but it's okay. <laughs> Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about the the Kate Brooks story? What's the? How did you get here, and and what what is your current body of work? So I've been in Perth for about five years. Prior to that, I ha- was involved in um, was a research. Um, actually an astronomer by by training so always been interested in um, exploring the universe Um, and about five years ago decided to I guess shift my stargazing to closer to home and um, figure out how I could best help businesses um, on their journey to think a little differently, embrace new technologies, disruption and opportunities coming their way. I've been with the Entrepreneurs Program which is a federal funded national program I've been with them for about the last two years and I work as one of their growth facilitators so I work with small medium businesses really helping them um, at, a, at a phase in their growth where they are transitioning from running a small business to becoming a little bigger and so we help them out with with anything we can um, networks information frameworks to to employ more people and grow their grow their customer base, and I guess prepare also for the opportunities that are coming their way. The uh, get off the tractor and into the office type of uh, type of story. When you just get to that level, and your project, what's uh, what's all that about? You're helping people to understand this next phase of of business, not just their business, but business. Yeah. So about a year ago, um, the the Entrepreneurs Program started to scope out a project on helping businesses get ready for net zero. And so what we we saw an opportunity here for businesses to start looking at their supply chains and understanding this net zero this shift to a net zero economy that we're seeing particularly mm. happening elsewhere in the world. Um, how can they prepare for that? Um, it really is a time for all businesses around the, around the world to take on sort of good environmental stewardship. Um, it's not only to help limit climate change, but really to future-proof them if they want to start selling their services into an economy where environmental stewardship is, is, is becoming a big a big thing. I think this is a really interesting point and, and it's one that I'm dealing with every day in, in, in my day job as general manager of supply chains. The businesses above us in the supply chain, the businesses that we sell to, are all already moving to decarbonise and they're asking their suppliers to do the same thing. We know that some big organisations are already rewriting their, their supply contracts to include questions or requirements as to their decarbonised uh, process or you know, where they are in the decarbonised transition. Let's put it into context. Decarbonising your business might in time prove to be the ultimate disruption, mind it. It's so fundamental to everything we do. 
But perhaps just take them a bit further, Kate. Why do they need to move to net zero or to decarbonize their business? It's not only the fact that there's that your your uh, buyers are expecting it. There's other drivers as well, isn't there? Yeah, I think the you know, like at the heart of any good small business decision, it's always about what's best for the business. And so you know, that's been a fundamental driver to everything that um, we do with the Entrepreneurs Program, working with businesses, is, is how can we set up the business um, for success? And we know some, if you think about some of the challenges um, that companies face, em- employing talent, em- recruiting, engaging customers, building relationships, all of those elements are becoming more and more important in the t- day-to-day running of a business. And all of them are starting to incorporate what values the business has, um, what does it stand for, and issues like environment are becoming more and more important, social, environmental, good governance. And so we know that the bigger companies, as you said, they're starting to set more and more targets around environmental um, metrics that that we're hearing them stating at their board level and in their annual reports that they want to reduce their carbon footprints. And the way the way the companies are measuring that according to the, these international benchmarks is not it's not only their footprint that they must include in the measurements, it's who they're buying from and mm. where they're selling their products to. And not so, just direct buyers, there's, there's two or three levels down. Absolutely. So all of a sudden their supply chains are being incorporated into their calculations. And that's where small, medium businesses are being included as well. So what we're saying to small, medium businesses is if you've got a customer that has made some uh, statements around net zero ambitions, very quickly it's coming down their supply chain and going to knock at that small medium business's door. Yeah, absolutely. But it's more than that though, because we also know uh, that it's hard getting staff these days. I was actually uh, at a conference for the defence industry in Sydney a couple of weeks ago, and they're talking about getting staff in this expanding defence industry, not defence, but defence industry. Uh, and one of the speakers was saying, you know, if you want to get the best staff, you really need to have a good approach to the environment because people are saying, I don't want to work for companies that aren't aren't doing the right thing. Um, There's a great story out of uh, uh, of Canada in the oil and gas industry. David Cand, who's one of the the, the, the heavyweights of that industry, was saying that the people are going home and their kids are saying, mummy or daddy or whatever, why are you killing the environment? (laughs) Can't you go somewhere else? And so they're being forced to leave the industry because of pressure from home. So it's, it's staff as well as... As well as um, as well as your know, suppliers, oh, sorry, your buyers. Um, we're also seeing some government things kick in here as well, isn't there? There's more regulations, more expectations. Absolutely. So it's only increasing, I guess, this this uh, demand for companies to be more aware of their carbon footprint and to have strategies in place um, to reduce it. And those strategies need to be shared with their staff, their customers, their stakeholders, as well as their future employees. Uh, I've been, you know, as a business person, I've been sort of looking at stats and KPIs and all those sort of things all my life. And net zero carbon emission is different from reducing your carbon footprint, isn't it? One's a number, one's a zero of net plus or minus, whatever. Whereas reducing your carbon uh, is a different thing. What are you, what's your project looking at? So our project specifically is helping companies get net zero certified. And I think it, at the end of the day, you know, the nomenclature is quite, you know, the carbon jargon is quite complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's all about encouraging businesses to reduce their carbon footprint. I guess the, the benefit of our project or, or one of the main deliverables is if you're going to do that, make that journey work for your brand as well. And the way you can demonstrate to your customers that you are committed to reducing your carbon footprint 
is to have a certification of that process. And so becoming net zero certified is a way to demonstrate to everyone that you are genuine or authentic about this. And it's a it's a it's a way to obligate your business to keep on that journey every year and better it. So the net zero certification that we're helping businesses achieve is really a four-step process. It's about measuring their carbon footprint in the first place. It's then um, finding ways and and through that process they identify what their big carbon emitters are in the business and then the second step is to work on projects to help decarbonize their business so work on projects that help reduce those the footprint and then whatever's left over look to offset that and there are many co-benefits that you can um, utilize in in carbon offset schemes but once you've done that, you then want to certify that whole process and that's where we're encouraging the businesses to look at certification schemes like Climate Active and then once that process is complete, you can then start to really showcase to your, to your customers and your, and your staff that you have that certification, you're committed to uh, achieving that every year and continually reducing your um, carbon footprint so that every year you buy less and less offsets it's one of those things of of, yeah yeah, it's one of those things of of uh if you don't uh, measure it you can't manage it and this is putting in that measurement as one of the key the key indicators of of how you run your business great idea and it's sort of it's not particularly um uh earth shattering in in its newness but it's such an important thing to do yeah, and it, and I guess what's very um, empowering for the businesses to to know is they're in complete control of how how quickly they want to accelerate along that that journey. Right. For many businesses, measuring their carbon footprint is the first step, and mm. that may be enough for um, to to really make changes in the business that are, I guess, correlated with with you know, the capacity that the business has at that time. So measuring the carbon footprint and just understanding what, say, the top three things are that contribute to the carbon footprint of that business is really empowering. Once you've got the data, you then can understand how much it's costing the business in terms of carbon um, and make changes to reduce that. And often those changes not only reduce the carbon footprint, but they actually can save on operational costs for the business as well. So it's a win-win. It reminds me of the 90s when we were starting to really get pressured about um, health and safety in our workplace. And we were saying to businesses then, just start measuring your lost time injury. Just start understanding what, what it looks like in your business in terms of a number. Get a number right. And from that, then you can start putting in uh, processes to to reduce the LTI, reduce all the um, all the impacts of what you're measuring. But the first stage is to is to get a number, find find out what it means. One of the problems that not one of the problems, one of the things I hear from small business owners all the time is, yeah, but why do I need to do this? Because you know the ships are burning flu, uh, um, burning carbon, and planes are burning carbon. You know, they're much bigger than I am. Why don't why do I have to worry about myself? Can you talk about scope one, two, and three? How does how does that work? So scope one, two, and three again. That's to part of that carbon jargon that comes comes yeah. with this net zero conversation. So you can do it better than me, see? Oh, I, and I'm by no way a carbon expert or consultant here, but I think the the best way to think about it is the sc- scope one and two are really what. Um, your organization's activities so it's what mm. you control yeah and um scope one is more around burning of fossil fossil fuels and scope two is around electricity consumption so so those so those two are really what your organization can control now scope three is where it becomes quite messy because that is everything upstream to your business and downstream. So scope three includes 
the carbon footprint of your um, your staff commuting, your leased assets, your purchase good and ser- services, your business travel. It includes um, your end of life treatment of your soul, the products you sell, um, the processing of any of those, the transport distribution, the use, all of that. And that um, is where it really starts, you, you start to appreciate that a small business can be caught up in someone else's scope three. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I think the main point here is, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah. And no, I think, and that's really that um, sort of light bulb moment for many business owners is this is, this is, this is great to um, be working on an initiative to engage staff and Im- improve climate and, and reduce your footprint. But at the end of the day, if your business is going to be disadvantaged because it has a higher carbon footprint than your competitor, that becomes a real point for a, for a, for a business owner to start to take note of this net zero uh, movement. And I, think, I think when it sounds... When you get into the, the what abouts, you know, um, what about this? What about that? What about that? What, you know, the answer is that very, very smart people have been thinking about this for a long time. Just because in Australia we're just now catching up doesn't mean that it hasn't already been thought through. And you don't have to change the world. You don't have to wait for the rest of the world to change. You manage what you can manage. You measure and then you manage within your, uh, your own business. I, I think the key part about all of this is, as you're saying, is worry about your own world and um, then just become part of the, the supply chain, but get your part right. So what have you learned? You've been doing this for a year or so now. What have you learned? What's, what are the things that jump out regarding how do a business start, to, how does a business start to governise? So I think the, the key learnings um, that have really jumped out from the businesses we've worked with, well, first of all, no surprises data is everything so data really um is a starting point for anything if you don't measure it you don't know what you're dealing with so you know our framework always began with measuring the data and that proved to be spot on um and there are i think there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to that we're finding some of our it's a bit like tax um you know it depends on the appetite the company has for how much they want to learn about tax. Right. Um, so, you know, if you're a small business owner, sole trader, pretty simple business, you probably do your tax on your own and submit your tax form. Uh-huh. If you if you're a bigger business and you know you've got a lot a lot of maybe um, supply chains, staff commuting, multiple sites, why would you want to? become a specialist in tax you you would outsource that work with someone who's up to date with all the latest rules regulations tips and tricks everything that can you know make this process as painless and effective as possible and so you would engage with that person and probably visit them every year to repeat and Mm -hmm. um and so that is almost the same i think that's a good way to think about carbon accounting it's how much so i'd be asking the businesses on starting out is how much effort and and time do you want to spend learning about this versus outsourcing it um and certainly setting yourself up for success from the get-go is is definitely a good approach so so if you're going to embark on frameworks and spreadsheets and carbon accounting methodologies use ones that let you that you're going to sit with for years and can scale and incorporate more and more of your business and reporting into that framework. So you start off understanding what, how big it should be in your business today and yeah. then un- understand that this might need to scale over time, so pick a platform uh, that is uh, able to be scaled. Yeah, right? even if the initial step is a small measurement, um, you want to make sure you, you don't have to, Rejig everything a few years from now, where you, when you've got that a new and put in a new process. Um, so that would be the first step, and there are plenty of um, online calculators, consultants, do it yourself through Climate Active. There are plenty of ways to to um, a business can navigate that. Um, and some of the businesses we're working with um, 
it's this is not always a job for the CEO. This is a real opportunity for someone in administration, in accounts, in HR, wh- wherever you know, whatever part of the business has that capacity to go through the go through the accounts, go through procurement, um, and put put that information into a database. Um, that's that's really where the job should sit in the business, and it's a great opportunity, also, James, for any staff who are looking for a bit of a career leg up, career opportunity to learn about this. We're finding some of the great um, stories in our businesses so far have been from junior staff who who have really just grabbed this and learnt about it and yeah, love doing this. That's a good tip. That's a good tip. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so when. Um, by the way, we'll put in the show notes some of the things that you just mentioned, the, the government um, carbon capitalists and uh, climate climate active, did you say? Yes, um, climate active, yeah. And, and a couple others. And if anyone's after a consultant to do that sort of stuff, get in contact with, with us here at the show at aigroup.com.au and we'll put you in contact with some consultants who can help you. Uh, I love this idea about helping someone in your business, you know, career grow uh, through getting into this nascent nascent industry yeah uh, after the break let's come talk come back and talk about where, where their carbon was coming from or what surprises they came across if you have supply chain or business improvement challenges contact ai group's business improvement and growth hub the big hub is a library of practical and relevant resources designed to assist member businesses to grow and improve The Big Hub also includes an extensive network of experienced, pre-qualified business improvement consultants. For more details, contact big at aigroup.com.au. That's big at aigroup.com.au. What what lessons did have you have you learnt from businesses in terms of where they where, where their carbon was coming from or what surprises they came across? Whenever you start one of these journeys, you always come up with something you didn't expect. So what stories have you got about uh, the clients that you've been working with? Yeah, we well, we knew we sort of went into the project expecting that when a company starts to measure their footprint that the, the, big, the big carbon items on their list were going to be energy, waste and transport. And I don't think there have been really any surprises to, to – to counter that Um, but perhaps what's been really powerful in um, measuring and identifying those is all of a sudden the companies have a number now they know what their carbon footprint is and if you start to put a price on carbon that becomes a a kind of monetary item now they Mm -hmm. know how much money those items are costing the business. So suddenly you've got a way to decide, okay, am I going, for example, transport of uh, goods are costing the business so much in carbon footprint. And if you use it, you can translate that into an amount and suddenly that becomes an amount of money that you can decide, okay, do I spend that on offsetting or that's my budget now to reduce this and I'm going to spend this much in the business this year to reduce that carbon footprint. So I think that's been the learning is having these businesses understand how much money the carbon is costing the business because then it allows them to scope out budgets for projects to decarbonise. Um, some of the challenges certainly have been en- we don't, energy. We don't, have, um, we don't have this opportunity just yet in, in Australia, but electric vehicles uh, has been one of the great ways of not only fixing your carbon footprint, but also reducing costs because an electric vehicle costs a lot less to operate than uh, an uh, internal combustion engine vehicle. And I tell the story often, some listeners may have already heard this, that uh, a, a fleet controller for PepsiCo in Seattle uh, recently said that they have 20,000 trucks on the road uh, every day delivering PepsiCo. Uh, it takes, uh, the, the trucks require refueling twice a day and they estimate it takes about half an hour to refuel. With electric vehicles, they can put batteries in it that will make the, car, the trucks go all day 
Uh, and so they've taken out one hour of downtime multiplied by 20,000 trucks multiplied by five days a week uh, into their business. Like, and that's just the act of filling up. That's not the cost of filling up. And then, of course, electric vehicles have a lot less operating parts. They don't have mufflers or carburetors or, or all sorts of things. So just the very fact of moving over to smarter technology can save your business a huge amount. It'll come into Australia soon. But I think that's what you're talking about, isn't it? Finding this, that, that there's an operating advantage to being carbon smart. Yeah, I mean, if you're... So if you're a business that decides to measure their scope one, two, and three carbon emissions and the transporting staff to and from work is a significant item in that carbon wow, account, yes, sure. then all of a sudden the companies are thinking, okay, well, how can I reduce that? So there are, they can throw a lot of things at that, working from home opportunities, incentivize staff to take public transport, encourage them to take up EV vehicles. So what can the workplace do to, in terms of infrastructure? Should they provide charging stations for staff um, and let them charge up for free while they're at work? All of these things become um, aspects that the company are thinking about for the first time because now because they know that it's costing the business in terms of a carbon footprint so these big things become a lot more important a company that's out in the middle of nowhere that has no public transport can't support public transport initiatives to their business if they understand how much it's costing the business every year in terms of carbon footprint to to have staff drive to and from that that site, they now have a number, a budget item that they can use to think. Okay, well, if we spent that much money and moved in the city or moved instead to a site that's closer to public transport, we can start to save every year on our carbon footprint. That means we have to buy less offsets. That's the saving to the business. So it's a real shift um, in in the way the businesses are thinking and prioritizing these decarbonization projects because all because now they understand how much it's costing the business in a net zero economy i think um, many listeners would be in a situation where they have suppliers they buy things from from suppliers this conversation also needs to be uh, in, involves suppliers isn't it? but the way the, the goods are delivered to you or the way what they come in Absolutely. We've got one, one of the projects we're working on, one of the companies in our project, their second, after, after electricity, their second uh, biggest item in their carbon footprint is waste. And it's all the packaging from the, the products that they purchase. To, yeah. um, so all their suppliers are delivering an abundance of waste <laughs> to, this, to this company every week. and it's left to the company to get rid of it. And they now know how much that carbon footprint is costing the business. So they can go back to their suppliers almost as a he- giving them a heads up and say, look, you need to either come and pick up this, this waste or find a way to send your products to us with less um, packaging. And if... You know, if there's an, a competitor out there that's doing that or can deliver the products with less waste, well, that company's going to switch in time. Yeah. Um, so that's where the whole supply chain is a call to action here. Yeah, it should be a case of getting in contact with your supplier and say, let's work out how we can do this smarter, like, like work together to yes. come up with the solutions, which is true supply chain efficiency. Yeah. And it doesn't have to... It's interesting because the companies may pay more for a more cost-effective low, I mean, sorry, a, a low waste solution because if they have to pay in the end carbon offsets to negate that, they may be better off buying a, a more uh, expensive product that has less waste. And that's where there's a win-win here. It's a win yeah. for the business and it's a win for the environment. And that's yeah. where that net economy is driving change. Yeah, yeah. And look at the net, the, 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 the complete transactional cost 
Uh, it's it's uh, it's a whole new way of looking at it, though, isn't it? It yes. really is this new frontier that is coming fast. We don't have yeah. any choice. We saw in 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 sort of recent elections, and we've seen plenty of reports of uh, major company CEOs are seeing sustainability as the biggest issue facing them. Investors are saying this. We know that the um, the European Union is moving towards a carbon tariff. It's the C C band. Um, it's coming fast. What what would uh, a company? What should a company do first? Okay, I've listened to Kate. Great idea. What should I, what should we do first? Well, as I said, Matt, you you're going in blind if you don't measure the data. So so you have to understand the data first. You have to pick out um, understand what what your carbon footprint is, where what the top three or four things are in the business that's costing you. And then knowing what the price on carbon is, you start to understand how much it's going to cost your business to offset that amount and keep, you know, achieve carbon neutra- neutrality. But um, I guess in keeping with that theme of sort of top three, what, what I would be doing is going um, surfing, surfing the internet when you, you know, finish this webinar or this podcast, sorry, and say, have a look at your top three competitors. Have they got net zero goals? Have mm. they got um, carbon research. neutral products yeah. that they're pushing on to your customers? Um, have a look at your top three customers. Have they set net zero goals? So start to understand how much of this is in is really coming into your into your supply chain. Um, it, if you're on the back foot, you need to act pretty quickly and get get the message out there that you're starting this journey as well. I guess that's another learning, James, um, which has just come to my mind is we've worked with many companies who are already doing a lot of great stuff. They've got a lot of sustainability initiatives. They've engaged staff. They've got paperless offices. All all of the low-hanging fruit they have got and really having a lot of success in their business with but no one else knows about it. Right. So what we're saying to businesses, start to share that, start to push that out. On, um, no, tell your customers that you are doing this. Wrap all of those activities up into a strategy that's helping build your brand and build your story around sustainability and net zero because that's, it, it, it's, it's, it's just... I mean, you, it's great for within your business, but you're missing the brand uplift opportunity if you're not pushing that message uh, out. Out. Sure. So it's not only good for the sustainability of your business; it's also good for the operating costs of your business, and it's good for your brand. You've got a marketing uh, aspect here for the early movers. So, so get into it. This has been a great, great conversation. Thank you for explaining it to us what you're doing and why it's important. We'll put in the show notes uh, maybe Entrepreneur's website or maybe your email or something. There's some way in which they can get in contact with you. Are you going to run another project or is it full now? Where are you up to with that? So last year we took on 18 businesses in WA to pilot this project and we've been working with them for one year, helping them achieve their net zero goals. And we are happy to deliver the program again to another group of businesses here in WA and also in Queensland. So uh, we'll, we, if any of the businesses are, uh, any of listeners out there are interested in this program, they can contact me and we'll give them more information. Um, but I think it's a combination of we will obviously work with the businesses one on one, but we also run a lot of learning events and webinars that um, is free to everybody. So just look out for that coming your way. My goodness, Kate, you're busy. I better let you go. Thank you for talking to us today. Thanks, James. 